We are now going to look at the actual fragment shader. This fragment shader corresponds to the MITES 3 program. Your homework 2 will require a slight generalization in order to extend it to multiple mites. Let's look at the fragment shader setup gate. Notice that the version is GLSL 3.30. That's what version 3.30 core says. Notice that the inputs coming into the fragment shader are the my vertex, which was from the vertex shader, my normal and texture coordinate. These values will be interpolated from the vertex shader and provided to each pixel or fragment. We will output the fragment color, which is the key value you get out from the fragment shader, what should be the color of the corresponding pixel. And we have some uniform variables. Uh, the texture text corresponds to the texture. Is text says, are we texturing or not? Is light, are we lighting or not? And uh, you the uniform weight three color. We then have the fragment shader variables. Notice that in the MITES sequence of programs, we always assume two lights. Light zero is directional, light one is a point light. The actual light values are passed in from the main OpenGL program. So we simply have light zero direction, light zero color. The color is an RGBA, which is why it's a VEC4, whereas the direction is a VEC3. Light one position in homogeneous coordinates is a VEC4, and light one color, which is in RGBA, is a VEC4. In your homework two, you will have to generalize this and handle general numbers of lights. We also define the material parameters. In this case, they are uniform for the object, which is simply the ambient, diffuse, specular, and the shininess. Note that ambient, diffuse, and specular are RGBA colors, while shininess is a single value. Here is the code to compute the lighting in the fragment shader. Notice the compute light command. It takes in the direction for the light source, the light color, the normal to the light, the normal, the half vector, and the shading parameters for the materials, which is the diffuse component, the specular component, and the shininess. Thereafter, it computes the uh, shading. So in the first uh, pro part of it is the Lambertian shading which is simply n dot L, which is the dot product between the surface normal and the direction corresponding to the direction to the light source. This is simply n dot L, and we can see that if we have a surface and this is the normal, this is the lighting direction, then it simply corresponds to the cosine of this angle. The Lambertian shading is then given by the diffuse component times the light color times max of n dot L comma zero. So that the max command just ensures that if you are below the surface, the value will be zero. We now talk about the specular component and here I'm computing n dot H. Again, if I have a surface and this is the normal, this is the lighting direction, this is the viewing direction, which is the view, viewer or the eye direction, then I will define the half vector in such a way that the lighting direction and the viewing direction have equal angle and I will be interested in the angle between the normal and the half vector direction. So this is n dot h, and then we multiply by the specular color uh, of the surface, the light color, and we take max of n dot h comma zero, and we raise it to the power of the shininess. So this goes to the power of s, where s is the value of my shininess. 
Finally, the return value from the shader is the sum of the Lambertian and Fong components, and that is returned. Let's look at the transformations applied in the fragment shader. The first step is to check whether texturing is greater than zero. If texturing is greater than zero, then the fragment color is simply given by the texture map. We don't do the lighting calculations. It would, of course, be possible to also multiply by the uh, lighting calculations and modulate it with the texture. In this case, we call the texture function with text being the texture map and texture coordinate being the appropriate coordinates for the texture map. Otherwise, if is light is equal to zero, then there is no lighting and the fragment color is simply the value of the color variable which was input promoted to an RGPA. Otherwise, we have to actually perform the lighting calculation. Note the OpenGL convention where the I is always at the origin 000, looking down the minus Z axis. Therefore, we define the I position as the origin 000 vector. Now we take my position to the position of the vertex involved, which is simply the my vertex xyz divided by w. This is simply a dehomogenization of the current vertex to define my position. We now need to know what is the direction to the viewer or the direction to the eye. This will be given simply by I position, where the I is, minus my position, where the vertex is. And we normalize this value in order to get a unit vector. Finally, we need the normal, which is needed for shading. And that is simply computed by a normalization of the my normal, which is passed in from the vertex shader. So this will be the normalized normal and the normalized viewing and or eye direction. We now handle light zero and light one. Note that light zero is a directional light source. So the direction to the light is simply given by light zero direction, which again we normalize to get a unit vector. We are now computing the half vector, which is simply given by the bisector of the lighting and eye directions, which can be obtained simply by taking the vector sum of these directions and normalizing the result. To get the color corresponding to light zero or the shading corresponding to light zero, we now call compute light, given this direction zero for the light source, given the light color, the normal, the half vector that we just computed, and the diffuse specular and shininess material properties. For light one, we have to first find the position by dehomogenizing, so this takes light one position x, y, z and divides by w. The direction to the light source is then the position of the light minus the vertex location. Remember that when we were computing the viewing direction, it was the i position, which was just the origin minus my pause. In this case, it's the light position minus my pause, and again normalized to get a unit vector. Notice that we are not computing attenuation in this example, but you can, of course, do so in homework too. To compute the half vector, we again normalize the direction to the light plus the direction to the eye. And then we determine a color by you calling the compute light function with the direction one, the light color, the normal, the half vector, and diffuse specular and shininess. Finally, the fragment color is simply a sum of the ambient, the color from light zero, and the color from light one. We will now talk about the source code in the display routine. Let us see what the light setup in display looks like. It involves a whole bunch of parameters which just correspond to the shading of the lighting parameters that we will use. So one is just white, its RGB is 111 with uh, one for the alpha channel. And we'll define these medium and small values. We define high for the shininess, zero. Light specular is now red, reddish with some green tinge. 
light specular one, you have green and bluish tinge. For the light direction, for the direction of light, it's uh, in the x is equal to 0.5 direction. For the positional light, we define the positional light coordinates. And now we transform the light direction and the light position to get light zero and light one. This is a transformation by the current model view matrix so that you have the light's position and direction properly transformed before you pass it to the shader. Why do we need to do this? So let's take a brief aside to talk about moving a light source. The lights transform like other geometry. Now, since lighting is done in 3D and not projected onto the image, only the model view matrix acts, not the projection matrix. And in fact, lighting is the only place where you care about multiplying by the model view matrix separately instead of a combination of projection times model view. There are many different types of light motion you can have. So if the light is stationary, you just set the transforms to the identity before specifying the light. If you want to move only the light source, you would push the matrix, move the light, pop the matrix. Sometimes you want something like a miner's hat or a light source attached to the camera where the light source is moved with the viewpoint. And so you can simply set the light to the origin and not have the model view matrix act or set it to the identity. In this case, the light is simply at the origin with respect to I coordinates. However, in the previous slide, what we were simply doing was moving the light into the correct location in I coordinates by transforming by the model view matrix. In fact, this is the helper function transform WEC I'm using for that purpose. It just takes an input for variables x, y, z, w and output for variables. So it first defines a GLM vector from the input variables and then defines a GLM output vector as model view times the input vector and then just sets the output values to output vector. So essentially, it's just multiplying by the model view matrix to transform the lights appropriately. This is what we need to do to set up the lighting for the teapot. First, I set up a uni uniform vector, which is three floating point numbers, light zero direction, and I set it to the value light zero. The one here just means that I'm specifying only one vector. So thereafter, I set up the light color, which is now four vector because of RGBA, and I set it to light specular. Light one position is set to light one. Light one color is set to light specular one, where light specular one is now a four vector that was specified earlier as just a constant. Then I set the material parameters, ambient, diffuse, specular, and shininess, against two variables that were defined as constants in my OpenGL program, small, medium, one, high. So essentially the ambient is a small value, diffuse is a medium value, the specular is just set to one, and the shininess is set to this high value, 100. We wish to enable and disable lighting along the teapot. So for the teapot, you set the uniform variable is light to one so that lighting will be done for the teapot. Normally, in order to do lighting, you'd also need to define normals for the teapot and so on, but the teapot object file, we've already done that within it. In the shader itself, we need to do some mappings in order to keep the bookkeeping straight. So first you define the vertex shader by calling init shaders with the file name for the vertex shader. Similarly for the fragment shader, you define a program. And now you set the shader parameter mappings where isLight tells you the location in the shader of isLight. In this case, I've just defined the variables same as the source strings in the shader, the variable names in the shaders, so it's easiest to keep track of, but they could be different. But essentially, this sequence of commands is required so that the variable specular in the OpenGL program stores the appropriate location for the specular variable in the shader, and then it can be assigned with the suitable value. 